Welcome to Ross and Merve. Wow, welcome everybody. Uh, Ross and I were joking beforehand that we didn't think Kafka himself could have filled a room like this during his time. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, I won't give too long of a preamble, but I do want to say something about why this is a very, very special book to me and a gift. I think, to all of us. And Ross has heard this story, so I apologize for telling it again. But about four years ago, I was reading for a prize, and one of the submissions that I read was in fact the first 50 pages of this translation. And those of you who have read for a prize, or who have read for admissions, or who have read anything, know that sometimes when you have a large stack of paper in front of you, the temptation is to skim. And there were other entries that I did, in fact, skim. But I remember starting to read Ross's sample at 2 a.m. on a Friday night and not putting it down until, uh, until 5 a.m. in the morning. It was so, so, so riveting. And I remember the entry that stood out in my mind for years and years and years after. Uh, an entry that I looked for in the old translation and couldn't find because it wasn't rendered as beautifully as it is rendered in Ross's translation, and it is this one. Kafka writes, I have been reading about Dickens. It is so hard, and can an outsider comprehend that one experiences a story in oneself from its beginning, from the distant point to the approaching locomotive of steel, coal, and steam, even now does not abandon it, but wants to be chased by it. And having time for this is chased by it and runs in front of it by one's own impetus wherever it thrusts and wherever one lures it. And then the next entry. I can't understand and can't believe it. I live only here and there in the little word in whose vowel thrusts above. For example, I lose my useless head for a moment. First and last letter are beginning and end of my fish-like feeling. And to have read those words four years ago and then to encounter them again with the publication of this momentous book is like, I don't know, it's like finding the one that got away four years later. So can we just have one big round of applause for Ross for this book? <laughs> this came about? I mean, there was already a translation mm -hmm. of the diaries. What motivated you to labor for eight years, eight years, on this new one? Well, I didn't plan to labor for eight years. <laughs> um, I thought it would go a lot quicker, very naively thought so. Um, but what happened was I had always, I had read Kafka since high school. I discovered Kafka in high school and uh, was immediately irresistibly in love with Kafka and all that he wrote and read the diaries when I was 16, 17 in the old translation, the old edition, and even decided to learn German largely to be able to read Kafka in the original, not even thinking necessarily of translating, just to be able to read him and a, a, a few other um, writers who I felt similarly about, like Ceylon and um, Nietzsche. And, uh, and then it took off of its own volition, German did, but one of the things that happened once I could read German and went back to read Kafka is I discovered that in German there were new editions of his, uh, particularly his posthumous papers, the papers that had been published after he died that he had never finished or, or turned into publishable editions that in around, in around the late 80s, early 90s, so I discovered these already in, when I was in Germany in the year 2003. I started reading the diaries and, and it was similar to the experience you had where it was just completely different from what I'd seen before. Um, and I realized I'd gone back to the notebooks and discovered that the previous edition had been um, heavily distorted by editorial interventions and censorship and been rearranged and made to seem much more cohesive and smooth than it was. Um, so that it, it was a revelation seeing the German edition of the um, based on the original notebooks, and the fact that it was nowhere in English seemed a scandal. Yeah. What, what were some of those distortions? You, you talk about them quite beautifully in your translator's introduction, but I wonder if you could just explicate them for, for people here. Well, um, 
there's a number of, of kind of categories of things that he categorically changed throughout the diaries. Um, this is Max Brod. Max Brod, yes. uh, uh, it's a long story in a way, but um, Kafka had left a letter for Max Brod um, with instructions on what to do with his unpublished work when he died, and it was to destroy it all, to collect it all first, because it was scattered around, he'd given things to different people, and to destroy it. Uh, the published works could stand, but didn't need to be reissued. Um, and Brode did precisely the opposite. In his own account, he says he told Kafka he would never destroy it. Uh, Kafka knew he was asking the one person who would never destroy it to destroy it, uh, which is an incredibly Kafka thing to do. Uh, and um, he rescued the papers, and then he not only rescued them from his own command to destroy it, but he ended up rescuing them also from the Nazis. Um, uh, and, and the whole publishing enterprise that he undertook began in Berlin and then quickly had to, uh, <laughs> to uh, flee to Prague and then to Jerusalem um, and, and then he, he published his editions. And what he did to, not only with the diaries, but also with um, uh, the unfinished novels um, and other unfinished manuscripts, when he created editions, one of the main things he did was to smooth everything out, polish it up, and tidy it up so that what was really um, uh, incredibly disorderly scribblings um, with a ton of incredible material, but nonetheless in disarray, he presented as very um, smooth and um, blowing uh, idiomatic German um, by editing it. Um, in the diaries, he did that and dragged, he left out um, fragments that were, seemed kind of marginal or trivial. Um, he censored anything, not anything actually, he left in some sexual stuff and censored other sexual stuff, and it's interesting what he chose um, to censor. It seemed like he left in um, sexual innuendo that was on a kind of elevated literary level. This is my sort of hypothesis. And he took out what could seem lewd or actually lascivious. Um, when it was about women, but when it was about men, he just took it out. Um, and in a way, as often happens with these things, it kind of happened with Proust, the censorship itself ended up drawing more attention to these passages than they might otherwise have received. Because they were deleted, everyone assumed there must be some big secret there about Kafka's desire, you know, male, sexual desires for other men. Um, uh, and now it's, you know, nobody knows exactly what it represented, but it might loom much larger precisely because Broad thought it was had to be suppressed. In any case, um, he, he cut all of that. Um, the, the language of the earlier translation, too, is quite a bit more stilted than, right. than yours is. I mean, yours really feels alive to me. And that's really important, I think, that um, um, Broad had an impression of Kafka's prose in its clean published copy that was itself not necessarily fully accurate, but it's more accurate of the stuff published, Kafka published in his lifetime than it uh, is of these uh, unfinished manuscripts. But his impression was that Kafka wrote in this very formal, perfected German, because Kafka did obsess over his writing, and he did himself, when things were edited for publication, get rid of the more idiomatic, um, the more regional uh, Austrianisms and Prague-isms um, um, and make it conform to some extent, to, uh, to high German. His, his punctuation is all over the place in his unpublished writing, and in his published writing, of course, it was fixed. So Broad did all of that to the unpublished writing. But the other thing when Kafka was writing in his diaries, I think he allowed himself to lapse into more of a spoken kind of rhythm, and so he would use contractions, and what gets contracted in German is different from what gets contracted in English, but because Broad's German edition was so formal, I think, instinctively, maybe even without thinking about it, the English translators of that edition tended to avoid contractions in English, too, and rendered it in this very formalized way. Whereas just by allowing there to be contractions when it's natural, I feel it sounds a lot more like that, that the more vocal rhythms of his, of his German prose in, in the diaries. Oh, one of the other things he did that you write about is that he excised the full first draft of the judgment Yes. The short story, The Judgment, from the diaries. And he also, and I found this fascinating, comparing the two editions, he moved around 
places where Kafka is kind of workshopping for himself mm -hmm. the beginning of a particular story over and over and over again, which appears across different notebooks, but Broad made it appear as if it were chronological. And he created a composite of some of those. Yeah. So there's one story, it's, it's often referred to as the you I said story, because in this, in this version of the diaries, you see him attempt the story, I haven't even counted, some 20 like tw something yeah, times, yeah, it's like by beginning times. of you, I said, um, and, uh, you know, and nudged him or whatever, you know, it then continues and he keeps continuing in different ways from that beginning. And then there's all other sorts of fragments that clearly belong to this, this um, piece that was never um, rendered as a whole and Broad just took the ones that he felt he could fit together like puzzle pieces and uh, fused them together into a continuous work. It almost, I've seen scholars who have said, well, you can read this as a sort of collaboration between Broad and Kafka, this story that now works as a cohesive story. Um, it kind of, it's incomplete, but cohesive, whereas in the actual writings, it's many, many um, stabs at a story that go in many different directions couldn't possibly all add up and are, in, you know, in my view, much richer in their variety and in seeing Kafka take another angle into the story, another um, departure from where he seemed to be going into a totally different type of thing. Um, um, new speeches, new monologues, new dialogues that couldn't all fit together and not break off and then begin again and break off and begin again um, uh, until he finally abandons it. Yeah. So, so before kind of pulling at particular threads in the diaries, you know, you have given us a, a, a looser, a, a livelier, I think a hornier Kafka. <laughs> how, how does this change the way we think about him, his place in the history of modernist literature, the work that you treasured as an adolescent, and I think many of us still treasure now, still teach now, what kind of Kafka comes out of the diaries that we might not have had access to before? And it's a, I, I found this question tricky as I've thought it through because there's some bits of Kafka that are, um, and I've seen this with any translation that's been deeply distorted. It seems like somehow something's always there of <laughs> like, you know, the old Tolstoy translations are, that are now considered outdated it still comes across, like what we still, the genius still comes across. So like what we think of as Kafka's voice, that agonized, self-probing, um, deeply alienated, painfully sensitive voice, I think is intact somehow, even in the distorted version. And in this version, I do feel like it, it's, this just breathes life into it. You can see him, it doesn't seem like that voice and that, um, even if we call it a persona, not to diminish it in any way, but that um, aesthetic, it doesn't seem like it just was there fully formed. We see it as something that he was working at, inventing on the page. So I think seeing Kafka much more, in a way, more as a writer and less as some kind of saint or um, uh, elevated genius figure um, uh, who just sort of um, had these visions and, um, conveyed them in this seamless prose, I think we see him much more as a, um, um, as, a, as a work in progress, but also as someone who was, um, he was constantly trying, experimenting and trying new things and trying to reimagine. It, it, one of the things I find fascinating about Kafka actually is that in some ways he's like a broken record because he, he just keeps coming back to the same preoccupations again and again. He has kind of one central plight, although you can't quite name what it is because it could be interpreted so many different ways because in a way what he's doing is he's always um, reimagining this central plight in, in so many different ways. So that now it's an animal story. Now it's a, um, an inner monologue. Now it's from the point of view of a dog. You know, now it's aphorisms, very brief, you know, puzzling aphorisms. Um, so this kind of uh, inventiveness, um, I think, comes across much more now, or, or seems much more central to me, that whatever he was doing, he was always driven to um, seek new creative um, forms. He says somewhere, there's an entry, maybe you can remind me of where it is exactly, but he says that his, 
particular constitution is made up of a strange mingling of minor vices, right? He says it's, it's a mingling of anxiety and fearfulness and a particular hunger for life that doesn't quite add up to the kinds of major vices that should cause people to suffer, uh -huh. but nonetheless causes him to suffer in this highly incoherent way, he says, right? And that's what he seems to be always reworking. I mean, that, that suffering that you're talking about, so much of it is localized to the, the relationship between, if I can be a little abstract for a second, the relationship between what we might call being or spirit or soul and body and the way that one's soul or being does or does not saturate, is not one with the body. And as I was reading the early notebooks, I was, I was noting the incredible attention he pays to the bodies of women, and particularly the kind of fleshiness of the bodies and the faces of women, and how that is contrasted at all points with his own kind of emaciated mm -hmm. being. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, or if there are particular entries you'd want to read, because some of them are really both uh, incredibly erotic and incredibly disgusting at the same time. Right. Yeah. 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 I, I have no idea what to make of it, other than like either he was he had mingled disgust and attraction to women as fleshy beings, or he was just disgusted by them, or he was just attracted to fleshy women. But I think there's an element of disgust. And, mm -hmm. and he also, just kind of, um, we'll find, I'll find a passage in a second, but um, the way he describes um, Felice, who we'll talk about in a bit, who he, he ended up getting engaged to twice and breaking both engagements and had a long um, courtship correspondence right. slash, right. yeah, um, existential. Yeah. Um, Our love lives crisis, only in letters. Right? Right? Yeah. I've, I've only known her intimately in letters, except yeah. yeah. The way he describes her when he first meets her, meets her, and is somehow smitten with her, it sounds like he also finds her pretty ugly. Yeah. Yeah. So he always seems to be finding women ugly, and the passages, and and it is an interesting, you know, in the complexity of his sexuality. That's not how he writes about his in the few passages where he does write about men. Yeah. It tends to be about their like smooth, well formed. Legs. Bodies or about their members, as yeah. he calls them. Yeah. yeah. I actually have um, one. Do you want to find one? We can read competing passages. <laughs> yeah, after mine, I know mine which one on, you're reading. I'm reading on 122, Frau, yeah. Frau uh, Tischsik. Oh, yeah. Yes. Sure. So she's an actress, right, in, in a Yiddish theater troupe, which yeah. in the, and the, the early notebooks are full of his impressions of attending the performances of this Yiddish... Yeah, he has this infatuation with Frau Chisik. Yes. Who then, uh, there's a great Isaac Bashevis singer story called A Friend of Kafka, because mm. he knew these Yiddish actors in Warsaw, and he was like, they were so, these shabby actors, and like, how were they friends with the great Kafka? Because, you know, it was later once Kafka was this worldwide renowned, including, you know, his friend Yitzhak Lev, Levy. Yeah. And, um, he says, like, how could Kafka have been infatuated with this, like, boring woman, you know, Madame Tishik? So here's, yeah, here's, here's, here's Frau Tishik. Yeah. Uh, Frau Tishik was beautiful yesterday. The actually normal beauty of the small hands, the light fingers, the rounded forearms, which are so perfect in themselves that even the unaccustomed sight of this nakedness doesn't make one think of the rest of the body. The hair parted into two waves and brightly illuminated by the gaslight. The slightly blemished skin around the right corner of the mouth. As if in childlike complaint, her mouth opens, running above and below into delicately formed indentations. One thinks that this beautiful word formation, which spreads the light of the vowels in the words, and with the tip of the tongue preserves the pure contour of the words, can succeed only once and marvels at the everlastingness. Low white forehead. The powder I've seen used up to now, I hate. But if this white color, this veil of somewhat clouded milk color hovering low over the skin comes from powder, then let everyone powder. She likes to have two fingers at the right corner of her mouth. Perhaps she also stuck her fingertips into her mouth. Yes, perhaps she even put a toothpick into her mouth. I didn't look closely at these fingers, but it appeared almost as if she had put a toothpick into a hollow tooth and let it rest there for 15 minutes. <laughs> And so there's something in that, right? The, the kind of high point of the attraction actually seems to be the words mm -hmm. that are forming. And in fact, that those words gain their attractiveness from that, that sense of the kind of curdling milk quality of the powder 
the, the hollow in the tooth where the toothpick, which picks out the food, is put. So to me, that's a very kind of complicated, very mingled description. Okay, you do yours, and then everyone can vote on which is the... Well, yeah, I think... Let me speak here. This is his first encounter with Felicia Bauer. Um, what page is this on? So, I can have so it's 226, but your pagination seems a little different. Okay. Like, it might be a little... Um, I'll find it before or yeah. after. No, no, I haven't. Okay. Uh, Fräulein Felice Bauer. When I arrived at Broads on, um, I have to read his date, which is a Roman numeral, and on August 13th, she was sitting at the table and yet looked to me like a maid. I also wasn't at all curious about who she was, but rather immediately reconciled myself to her. Bony, empty face, which wore its emptiness openly. Bare neck, thrown on blouse, looked very domestically dressed, although, as it turned out later, she was not at all. I was strange from her a little by getting so physically close to her. Indeed, what a state I'm in now, estranged from everything good in its entirety, and moreover, don't believe it yet. If the literary news at Max's doesn't distract me too much today, I will still try to write the story about Blankout. It need not be long, but it must strike home to me. Sorry, that's a bit of a departure, a digression, but then he says, he continues his description of her, almost broken nose. Blonde, somewhat stiff, charmless hair, strong chin. As I sat down, I looked at her more closely for the first time. By the time I was sitting, I had an unshakable judgment. How? And that's, it just breaks off after the word how. But it seems that he has an unshakable judgment. And then he goes on to have like two years of passionate correspondence love with her. I mean, it's, it's, it's so interesting, you know, I, I, I mean, well, I suppose one could say that there's no accounting for taste, but I think, there, I think there is an accounting for taste that we could do here, which is that when he talks about his own body, he uses the term a little bit later on in the diaries, play acting, as if the body that he were inhabiting, as if he were estranged, right? That's the word that I keep thinking of that appears in that diary entry. As if he were somehow estranged from the sight or from the movement of his own hands, whether they're reaching out for another person's hands or whether they're committing some kind of word to paper. And there's both a beauty and a kind of ugliness in that sense of estrangement that he seems to feel so deeply in relationship to himself, but also to his work where the words themselves seem to be bodies to which he's having uh, these, these, these reactions of, of pushing them away from him at the same time that he's recognizing that they're his. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, he talks about language often in bodily terms. Like he talks about, doesn't he, he talks about like two vowels rubbing against each other. Yes, like, he does, yes he does. As if you were sticking your tongue in a hollow tooth or yes, something yes, like that. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, and... Um, Words are sometimes stabbing, you know. Um, his his experience of language was very bodily, um, um, very and, and tortured uh, in, in the body. But his his experience of his body, I mean, there's a whole you know sort of autobiographical history to it. Um, he writes about being in the you know, changing cabin with his father. Uh, uh, at the beach and seeing his father's robust, you know, broad, strong body. The Kafkas had strong bodies, but his mother's side, the Levies, were a little more delicate, and he was more of a Levy, a Levy, uh, let's say. Um, and um, uh, you know, and saw himself as this weakling, the sapling, and you know, skinny and, and weak and long. He was really tall for that um, era and gangly. And, especially, and he had, a, he had a lot of eating, weird eating issues too, um, uh, and wrote about weird eating stuff in a lot of his stories. So um, yeah, his relationship with his own body was pretty um, um, self-recriminating, uh, as his relationship with most aspects of himself were in some way or another. But, but also his relationship with German too, right? I mean, there's an early entry where he talks about mm -hmm. the word for mother mm -hmm. in German, right? Where he talks yeah. about saying Mutter, Mutter, yeah. right? As, 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 as being kind of in, incorrect or, or for his mother. formidable yeah. for his mother. He right? says it affected his relationship with his mother yeah. because it sort of like stood between him and her. This, the German <laughs> word Mutter couldn't describe his Jewish mother, he says. Right. Um, 
but and then he said maybe mama would be better but you can see you can still hear the mutter behind it and uh and the jewish word father also doesn't the german word father also doesn't describe the jewish father and maybe like this is what survives of the memory of the ghetto like now yeah. this bourgeoisie german family uh, jewish german speaking jewish family in prague um so yeah i, I do think he had at least in that moment, he was reflecting on that. Um, yeah. um, I mean, it, it, there's, I, there's this. I think it was quoted in the New Yorker review, and that's why I'm thinking of it. A line by his biographer that like Kafka could make anything into a problem, like it seems like he could also anything could alienate him, right? Language alienated him, the body alienated him, his Jewishness alienated him. Like he has a very famous passage where he says, "What do I have in common with the Jews? I barely have anything in common with myself." And I should just stand in a corner, you know, with my head down, being quiet or something. Um, uh, which is, you know, it, but he has these moments, and I took, just come back to this sort of, I started out talking about this invigorating, invented, creative quality. Like, he doesn't then stand in a corner quietly, right? right he, instead, right, he right. constantly um, comes up with these um, visionary reimaginings of, of, of these preoccupations and that's that's what seems like he's always maybe when you said you mentioned play acting like there's the, you know I, I was this took me eight years and I I could find myself saying you know really despairing things about the project when I was in the midst of it and sometimes he's just confetching at this really high yeah. level and, and and maybe somewhat of a um, self-dramatizing way mm -hmm. you know he's also writing uh, whenever Kafka was writing he was trying to write literature, whether he was writing a diary or a letter. Um, you know, when you see the facsimiles of these pages, um, even in their, you know, unfinished form, they're covered in corrections. He's constantly crossing things out, rewriting things. He didn't treat any of his writing as anything but writing to be revised and reworked and turned into literature and potentially published. He did sometimes extract diary entries and publish them in literary magazines as prose pieces with a few names changed or whatever. So I think because anytime he was writing, he was also creatively reimagining his experiences as literature, at least potentially doing so. He, there is always some play acting, some self-traumatization, and some of that, for me, sometimes I, I put it in terms of this Jewish inheritance of, of, of anxiety and suffering, and then a sort of corresponding Jewish inheritance of the um, um, comic self-presentation of anxiety and suffering. Right, yeah. so is he is he play acting at love? Because the you know, the 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 two other books that I think about the diaries in uh, that, that orbit the diaries for me are the letters to Felice and the letters to Milena, which as I told you before, I think are probably the greatest love letters ever written. Maybe Ingeborg Bachmann and Paul Ceylon gave give them a run for their money. But but I think the letters to Milena are truly, truly extraordinary. But when you read those, as when you read some of the diary entries around Felicia, there aren't that many diary entries around Milena, right? Uh, you do get the sense that he is putting something on mm -hmm. a little bit, or that he has, that he has, you know, there there's, there's somewhere where the anguish reaches a point, oh, sorry, the anguish reaches a point of exaggeration or tips over into into farce. Absolutely, yeah. I think I I, I have to read it that way. Or I I kind of can. That's something that's maybe changed a little bit for me when you asked me about that earlier and, and how how I think about Kafka now as opposed to when I first read him in the earlier editions is that I I, I always see him um, um, play acting. I guess um, not not in a way that would diminish the sincerity of these internal struggles. Right. But he's always um, turning them into something uh, for the page, at least, if not for an audience. I mean, there's this, he read a ton of writers' diaries. It's one of his favorite things to read with writers' diaries and letters. He writes about what it's like to read writers' letters and how that compares to reading your own letters. And um, uh, it's a series of great entries on Goethe's diaries. Yeah. Right? Yes. And and he even talks about how that affects how he feels when he's writing his own diaries, and that he compares his own diary writing unfavorably to Goethe's. So there's a way in which he was writing his diary, even though he then said he wanted it destroyed and didn't want posterity to read it. Um, at the time when he was writing it, he was taking, like I said, he was extracting pieces from it and publishing them. And there's, a, there's some entries early on in like 1911, 1912, where he has a plan to read some of his diaries to his friends for New Year's. 
and then he can't find it. He's flipping back through them, and he talks about what it's like to flip back through old diary entries, and then he, um, you know, ends up not finding anything he wants to read to them. So the idea that he was going to present these to an audience, and in fact, there's a point pretty late in the diaries where he um, gave all of his previous notebooks and then ripped out the pages of that notebook and then says, like, just gave all the diaries to M, meaning Milena. He gave her all of the diaries from before that entry. Um, and there's a point, and then the notebook continues briefly before you get to the chronological end of the diaries. So he also gave them all to this woman, who was then at least an audience of one. So, um, and, and it, you know, part you could say, oh, I gave you my diaries, it's so romantic, I'm opening up my most intimate self to you, but it could also be like, oh, I'm giving you my writing, right. you know, to read how I've, um, uh, made these these brilliant, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, must have been yeah. interesting. But yeah, like when Max Brode, he had to get them from Milena before he right. published them. Right. Um, and he gave stuff to, he left stuff with Dora Diamant too, and that's a big like right. detective story right now where people are trying to find out if those stories ended up in some Soviet, anyway. Well, no, 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 but it's interesting because, you know, the years, you know, as I was reading this, I was thinking about the kind of asymmetry that is in the diaries, which is that from 1910 to about 1914, he's writing long, long, long entries, sometimes multiple entries every day. He is, as you said, reworking the introductions to stories. He's writing, I think, quite amazing literary criticism, literary and theatrical criticism. I mean, everything is in these diaries. And then between 1915 and 1923, and that's, that's I should say, you know, 1910 to 1914, 15, about the first 300 pages mm -hmm. of the main diaries. And then the next 150, 170 or so are from 1915 to 1923. And it seems like they really kind of drop off. The entries are shorter, they're more fragmented. Uh, what, what happens in the second half of his diary keeping? Is it because he's writing more intense letters to people, because he's spending more time on his prose, what explains why it kind of thins out as we get toward the end of his life? It's complicated, because he, he did write more frequently in these other notebooks um, that have been, they were published separately by Broad as the Blue Octavo notebooks. So these, the, it's, these are just sizes of notebooks that Germans use, so the, uh, or at least used, I think they might still, uh, in stationery shops or whatever. Maybe other people use them too, but they're not that common in my, you know, conventional life. Um, but uh, so the, these diaries, or the diaries, he called them as diaries. He gave them to Melina and said, "Here are my diaries." These were written in brown, you know, um, a quarto notebooks, and those other ones were, which uh, were not considered diaries by Broad or by the critical edition, and which because Kafka never explicitly referred to them as such in his lifetime, they contained somewhat different types of writing because he started to do a different type of writing at that time, which was more philosophical, these aphorisms. Like, there's this old, I found this book by, um, it was a digression, but um, Paul, Paul Goodman um, called uh, Kafka's Prayer. That's all about the aphorisms. It's really early in Kafka criticism. He's like, why, don't, why aren't more people reading this guy, sort of, still? Um, and. Uh, but anyway, yeah, they're, they're very different. They, they lend themselves to that kind of exegesis or Talmudic reading. These, they're very brief, you know, he was writing these long, um, unfinished novels and involved stories. Um, and, uh, and then he started working on this other type of writing that was about compression and these kind of baffling riddles, you know, almost writing riddles. Um, and he was doing more of that in those other notebooks. So during the, those are the years, well, I think roughly 1917 to 1919, where there are eight notebooks um, that aren't considered diaries. Where, so he, he was always, and he was writing letters, but he did, there were some really intense phases of letter writing in those early years where he was writing letters to Felicia contemporaneous with the diaries. But there too, the diaries don't contain as much of that part of his life as the letters do. The stuff that's in the letters is not really reflected in the diaries and vice versa um, at that time. They kind of supplement each other. Perhaps I will, I'm just mindful that we need to turn to audience questioning in a little bit, audience questions in a little bit. Uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit about Kafka's rage, because that was the other thing that I feel like was perhaps toned down, not exactly excised, but certainly toned down in the previous edition of the diaries, whether through entries that were left out or through choices of translation, was that 
you encounter a Kafka who is deeply angry mm -hmm. at times, and especially toward his family, mm -hmm. uh, especially toward his mother. There are some really kind of vengeful scenes in here toward his mother, but also toward writing. And I'm thinking about the final entry mm -hmm. in the diary. Uh, so I have it on 497. And I think this is just extraordinary. So here's the last entry that he writes. And I mean, you really, I think as a translator, and you, you couldn't ask for a better, I don't know, I wanna say mic drop, but you couldn't ask for a better mic drop than this final entry. So here it is. And this is 19, this is either the beginning of 1923 or the end of 1922, right? Yeah, it's 19, sorry, excuse me. It's uh, 1923. 1923, okay. More and more anxious while writing. It is understandable. Every word twisted in the hand of the spirits, this flourish of the hand is their characteristic movement, becomes a spear turned against the speaker. A remark like this most especially, and so on to infinity. The consolation would be only, it happens whether you want it or not. And what you want helps only imperceptibly little. More than consolation is, you too have weapons. That is an extraordinary ending, but that idea of the word as a weapon that not only pierces your heart, but allows you somehow to pierce it is a wonderful dialectic on which to end. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about Kafka's anger and the way that anger or that violence yeah, he's very stabbed. Yeah, he's very stabby. Lots yeah. of stabbing going on yeah. in these notebooks. Yeah. Yeah. His headaches stab him. Yeah. 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 Words yeah. stab him. I mean, a, a twist of the knife in the heart for the first time felt pleasurable. Yeah, he yeah. writes in an There's early a, entry, right? The pleasure in, it's, it's actually more twisted. Yeah. Uh, it's like the, the pleasure in imagining for the first time in a long time, a, long time. a knife being twisted into my own heart or something like yeah. that. Like it's something he forgot that he enjoyed imagining. Um, so the prosaic question is, why is he so stabby? Yeah. And the slightly more complicated question is, what is this dialectic well, about being pierced by words and using them to pierce others? I have a read of this last diary entry that's maybe, I don't know if it's um, contradicted by any um, scholarship that I don't know about, but I just wonder if his weapons here have to do with um, the testament. No, I think it's not known when he wrote this letter to Max Brod saying to destroy his writing. Yeah. He seems to be saying that these words twist in the hands of the spirits, become a spear turned against the speaker. I almost, and maybe it's just my, a sense of guilt for continuing this posthumous um, um, uh, betrayal of Kafka's wishes, but it's, it, it seems like he's saying, you know, I, I can extinguish all of these words maybe and then they won't be turned against me by these spirits that twist my words or twist them against me. Um, but um, I don't know if, if that's right or biographically tenable to claim, but I just wonder what, if these weapons themselves are words or if the weapons are somehow a weapon against this enemy of words or of the spirits who, who distort his words, who maybe wear among them, you know. Do you feel like translation is an act of distortion? Is it an act of twisting the knife pleasurably ever deeper into the heart? I don't feel that way, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Are uh, you guilty of crimes? Yeah. This, translating this felt like having something twisted in, into my own um, <laughs> um, self. But um, so I guess it was a pretty Kafka kind of experience, <laughs> somatic experience. Um, uh, it would also just make me really sleepy. Um, <laughs> racking my brain. Um, but but um, uh, I do want to give you an anecdote before, before we stop about this entry with yes, this please. flourish because I did wonder at times, you know, in year six or seven of revising this whether it was diminishing returns and whether I was just changing things and changing them back and so on. And then I got to this last entry again after, you know, going through the whole text yet again. And um, there, the word that I translated as flourish, um, it suddenly hit me that this word, which could mean a kind of movement or a kind of swinging movement or um, 
uh, this word schwung, that he always used it in talking about writing. There's this adjective schwungvoll or geschwungen that he uses to talk about sort of sweeping writing or bold strokes of writing. And I realized that the schwung is a flourish in the sense that you know, writing is a flourish or the pen on the page, which is also a, another stabbing, is, the, is, is his, his pen that he was using to write on the page. And if you look at his writing, he did write in a very, um, but um, yeah. And so on to infinity. Yeah. yeah, well, I made the mistake, Ross, of tweeting that, and I think the, of that tweeting, that final entry, and I think the writers on Twitter got hold of it and read it incorrectly as a kind of motivational quote, like, you two have weapons, mm -hmm. like, go forth and write. And so I'm afraid we're going to see people yeah. with motivational Kafka t shirts and, that's okay. and yeah. tattoos and things like that. <laughs> they twisted, it's another twist of the it's spear. Another twist of the knife but I think that heart, yeah. it's kind of what happens with Beckett, right? Because yeah. someone yeah. said, like, this reads like Beckett, and I yes. thought, it reads like that misreading of Beckett. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for this. Really, I'm going to be reading this over and over and over again in the years to come. And I really hope you do translate the octave books, the blue octave books, so we can see the non diary diary entries that are missing from this, if it isn't too painful for you. Uh, I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience. If anyone needs a mic, you can have mine. We have one back there. One mic here. Do you know if he underwent any psychoanalysis? I know that that school of thought was sort of taking off, like, I don't know, in the early 1900s, and I'm just curious if uh, there is any association, affiliation. He, he didn't, uh, but he was very aware of Freud and psychoanalysis. He mentions Freud here and there in the diaries and elsewhere in a couple places, um, infrequently but enough to show that he was completely aware of Freud. And um, uh, he, he even mentions Freud after he writes The Judgment in the diaries. Right. The entry after The Judgment, he talks about the different associations he had while writing and uses thoughts of Freud. It's a father-son story where the father condemns the son to, spoiler alert, to, to death by drowning. Um, and um, he says thoughts of Freud just as a, but um, he, he didn't, um, he, he thought, from my understanding of what he thought of psychoanalysis is that it was right except in so far as it saw mental illness as mental illness. I don't think he believed in the category of mental illness. And he thought that these, these kinds of um, observations about um, the unconscious and so on were accurate, but it wasn't these, the, the premises that it was illness was wrong. <laughs> he has this uh, wonderful key to the judgment that he provides oh, yeah. in the diary where he does something that is so immature that I was actually shocked to encounter it, where he says uh, something like, he says something like George has six letters or five letters, and Franz has five letters, yeah. and Felice has however many letters, and the woman in the judgment has however many letters, yeah. and so that's me, and that's her, and you're right. like, you're shocked to encounter yeah. that kind of really quite uh, immature, immature. He dedicated it to yeah. her, too. Yeah. yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, he, he even wrote her a letter where he said, I dedicated to you, but it has nothing to do with us, even though the bride is part of the downfall, like the bride right. meaning the right. fiance, right. and she was his fiance, it's part of the downfall of the protagonist of that story, so it has nothing to do with us, except that I may have used your initials unconsciously and right. like all the names line up right. with our names. Right. Right. Benda has the vowels in the same place as Kafka okay, and yeah. it's Benda Man, but Man is just man, so it's just like universalizing that yeah. name. And he says Brandenfeld, Frieda Brandenfeld, FB, Felita Bauer. Yeah. And Bauer means farm and Brandenfeld has a feld in it and that means field, but it has nothing to do with you. Yeah, yeah. 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 this story in which a yeah. man's uh, marriage or engagement leads yeah. his father to order him to commit suicide has nothing to do with you. Right. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, over there. Hello. Um, you talked a little bit earlier about Kafka's relationship with food and his body. Um, one of my favorite Kafka stories of all time is the hunger, the hunger artist, um, where a man is in a cage starving himself, essentially, and it's a public spectacle. Um, I love that story so much. Does he ever mention it in the journals? And I would love if um, it would be possible to read just like a little snippet of some of his like um, eating disordered or body conscious 
thinking, um, because I imagine that would sound really interesting to compare it to the hunger artist. Yeah, um, are you finding it? Find it. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I have so many flags in the book that it's, you know, enough flags, and it's like another kind of Kafka thing. If you put a flag on every page, then. Um, but um, he was a, a vegetarian who Fletcherized his food, meaning he, he masticated a certain number of times before he chewed it, it a certain number of times before he would swallow. And he talks about you know having strawberries for supper, and um, he's obsessed with his digestion. It's part of his. He, he was also kind of a dandy, like he dressed really meticulously. He was he was really obsessed with all manner of kind of physical aesthetics um, and self presentation. There's a lot of scholarship about you know. Um, the Jewish body at that time and how that was thought about. There were, he, he starts a review of a writer named Hans Bluer, who wrote at the time. Um, it, he, he was, I mean, the, the, the cliche would be to say he was kind of a self-hating Jew, I think, Bluer. I think he was Jewish, but it's a very anti-Semitic book in its tropes. Um, but it, it's all about the Jewish body being sort of feminized and associated with weakness, but also with homosexuality and all of these kind of overlapping um, marginal um, um, images of the body that were associated with Jewish bodies. And some of that, you know, there's, scholars have made much of that in terms of how it influenced Kafka or how that um, maybe uh, affected his psyche or just his relationship with his body. Um, I don't know if that helps clarify things or just makes them more confounding, but, um, I'll keep looking for an entry. I seem to have dog-eared everything about sleeplessness and headaches, not uh, Yeah, sleeplessness headaches, is a so, big thing, too. Yeah, yeah, so let's take the next question, and I will we'll circle back to Well, just one more thing, sorry, about the body that is interesting to me is that Kafka eventually did have a serious illness with tuberculosis, but from the very start of the diaries, he writes about himself as if he's ill. And he, he doesn't just write about his symptoms, you know, with that kind of hypochondriac obsession, but he refers to, like, illness, and as if he has this vague, and that was, the diseased body was also very much trope at the time, associated with Jewish bodies, yeah. I mean, when he's diagnosed with tuberculosis, he says, if this is a symbol, oh, let yeah. me seize yeah. it as a symbol, right? He I can read that, that Yeah, read that. Because that's, like a symbol as much as like the, the, the entry about Felicia doesn't sound like somebody falling in love, the entry about getting tuberculosis does not sound like how you would think what you would think you would write after you were diagnosed with tuberculosis. He seems, here it is, uh, September 15th, 1917. It's the first entry in his 12th notebook. So he started a new notebook after the diagnosis. He sort of hemorrhaged in the night and then was diagnosed with um, uh, tuberculosis of both lung apices. He wrote, you have, as far as this chance exists at all, the chance to make a beginning. Do not waste it. You won't be able to avoid the filth that wells up out of you if you want to penetrate, but don't wallow in it. If the lung wound is only a symbol, as you claim, symbol of the wound, the inflammation of which is called felice, and the depth of which justification, if this is so, then the medical advice too, light, air, sun, rest, is symbol. Take hold of this symbol. Yeah. What does that mean, take hold? take hold of the symbol? What did he want to do with his diagnosis, with his blood? What? I think maybe he wanted to change the way he lived, because he wants, he's talking about the medical advice for light, air, sun, rest. Yeah. And he did always have this urge to do gardening or carpentry or something with, with, it goes back to the body, right? He wanted to do something that felt sort of pure and harmonious between the body and nature. And he, he kind of, um, he had all these things he valorized that, you know, there was that, uh, gardening, carpentry, um, he idealized marriage, but then he had all these things he idealized that he then seemed um, innately averse to, to doing. Although he did actually enjoy gardening, he did do some of that in carpentry and found that he didn't he sort of reproached himself for failing to really follow through with that. But here he does, you know, start, like to go to sanatoriums. He's a natural health um, uh, adherent. Uh, he believes in naturopathy. He goes to these nudist sanatoriums. You know, there was there were all these movements at the time that he was very attracted to um, in his Kafka way, where he's also a little ironic about it. Always in the diaries, um, even Rudolf Steiner and Theosophy. There's a great passage where he 
is at once kind of taking theosophy seriously and completely mocking it, right. um, which is what he did with everything with Zionism. It's like, oh, he seems really interested in this. Oh, wait, no, is he just making fun of it? Or because he just can't help kind of seeing the contradictions and things. But yeah, so I think, I think that he thought, okay, the lung wound is a symbol of, of this um, bad way you've been living. With, um, and the, the medical advice too then is a symbol to, to live in a better way live in this other way. He always wanted to kind of change his life, get away from his job, either get married or go live in the countryside or um, somehow break out of this prison. Um, so. This is my favorite entry with regard to his body mass. Um, this is, hmm. um, I think this is May 5th maybe? I can't tell, uh, December, I don't know, I can't tell, because he alternates between Roman numerals right. and, and, yeah. He writes the year in Arabic numerals right. and then a Roman numeral for the, no, he writes the day mm -hmm. in Arabic numerals and a Roman numeral for the month. And, right. and I was obnoxious enough to maintain that. I'm going to start dating my checks like that, yeah. Uh, okay, so this is, he writes, um, I'm starting in the middle of an entry. Therefore, the best advice remains to accept everything as calmly as possible, to behave like a heavy mass, and if one feels oneself blown away, not to be lured into any unnecessary step, to look at the other with an animal gaze, to feel no remorse, to abandon oneself to the unconsciousness that one believes to be distant, even though one is presently being burned by it, to let one's angular, unchangeable limbs lie as they please, in short, to press down with one's own hand whatever ghost of life is left, that is, to increase even more the final grave-like peace and let nothing else continue to exist. A characteristic movement of such a state is to run one's little finger over one's eyebrows. Isn't that amazing? I, the, the, you know, the last entry, right, where he's using the you so insistently, and you mm -hmm. see it in the German, right, the du, du, mm -hmm. repeated. Um, but he has these entries where he writes in this sort of strange, impersonal, right? Mm -hmm. One must do this, one mm -hmm. must do this. And he's obviously, it's so idiosyncratic, he's obviously talking about himself, uh, yeah. right? But there is that default often in many of the entries where things do seem to get very close to a kind of death vision mm -hmm. where he retreats to that one. Mm -hmm. What is that like in German? I mean, what's the differentiation yeah. in German? It's interesting. Um, I thought it was really important to keep it. In, in, in German, it could be argued that this one, this man, while impersonal, can probably be used more often than in at least American, contemporary American English, to refer to oneself or to the people one's with. Like, we, we'll do it a little bit if we're like, oh, one shouldn't, I guess it's only the shall usually, or like, uh, maybe we don't really do it. I, well, I but, usually use it in writing when I'm trying to, when something is obviously my own opinion, but right. I'm trying to distance myself from it a little yeah. bit, you know, one word shorter, et cetera, et cetera. But in any case, I, I do think he, he is aware, maybe not aware, but intuitively, when he alternates between pronouns, it matters. So, and the fact that you mentioned that about the you, as you said that, I was like, oh, it's good that I stuck to that. Because when he does say you, he's saying, saying you. And it's also usually, uh, <laughs> right. Right. He, uh, even the castle famously, K, the character who's known as K, and he was originally in the first person. So he just changed all the e, you know, all the I's to K's. Right. Um, but um, uh, yeah, and then he has these he entries, which have been published separately outside the diaries as a book called the he aphorisms, or as a series of aphorisms right. called the he aphorisms. But in the diary, they're clearly also self-reflective right. in some fashion, but they're all about he. That's very yeah. Other questions? Yes, over here. Okay. Thanks. Well, first of all, um, congratulations and thank you for this monumental translation. Really excited to dive in. Um, you mentioned the Blue Octavo notebooks, which are some of my favorite Kafka writings. And um, I did wonder whether you, when you read the Blue Octavo notebooks in German, do you feel like they're also in need of reinterpretation, revision, revisiting through, through translation in the same way that you felt with the, the regular diaries? And if you would undertake that, that's my first question. The second one is more fun, which is just, did you keep a diary while doing this? And do you have anecdotes about Kafka's brain and soul entering you in some strange ways while you were keeping your own diary? Yes, uh, number one, uh, I'll get back to 
on the book, Tava notebooks. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't looked into um, what the current editions that are out there do. Um, and, and, and yeah, I haven't looked into that, so I'll have to look into that. Uh, I, and I don't know whether it's a good idea for me to, to do another Kafka translation right away. <laughs> um, but um, I'll get back to you. Um, the, um, I, at first, when I first started this project, I was like, I'll keep a diary the whole time. Obviously, that's a thing to do. And then in the back of my head, like, I'll publish it as a book when I'm done. Um, so that didn't really happen. But I did, you know, I do keep notes. Um, and, but even my emails, you know, were infected by Kafka's syntactical um, intricacies. <laughs> Because he, he writes these sentences with just endless subclauses and qualifications. It's, he's so slippery. One of the hardest things about translating him is the tone. Because just a word, he throws in these little particles to be sure, you know, I, that I translate as things like to be sure or certainly. That suddenly you're like, wait, does he mean certainly or is he being ironic? You know, so, and even my emails started to get inflected in that way where I was like, why can't I just say something straight anymore? <laughs> so, yeah. I think we have time probably for one, maybe two more if you're quick. So let me pick two people really. Okay, one and two over there. Just wondering if he ever wrote anything about the Spanish flu, which was ravished in Europe. And which he had, but I'm not sure if he wrote something elsewhere. Um, yeah, I didn't, I was thinking, do I, once I start doing events about the diaries, do I need to make sure I reread all of Kafka's work so that I can be authoritative about this stuff? But um, he, he didn't write about the special in his diaries. It, it was during those years that, where he wrote very little. It's 1918. Um, but he had it. And I know from his biography, there's, um, maybe it sounds bad to call it a set piece, but there's a chapter, at least, or a passages of Reiner Stach's biography of Kafka that describe when he had the Spanish flu, that came out before COVID and so on, that um, I found really moving. Because it was also the end of the war, um, and Kafka could see out his window, apparently, the like um, parade, of, to, it was also the proclamation of the Czechoslovak Republic, that you know, finally being a, a nation, um, a state for the first time after being under the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the dissolution of the emperor, empire. Apparently, while he was Bedridden with the Spanish flu, you could see that happening outside his window in the center of Prague. So, pretty amazing. But um, I don't know if he put anything down and right. He was sick. So, um, hi. Um, this is a question about the process of translation. But you mentioned like a couple things that you had to think about when you're translating. But I was wondering if there were any particular like translation problems that. Um, you either look back on with trauma or find amusing <laughs> um, or like triumphant and you finally figured out what they were supposed to be? Uh, let's go with the music because <laughs> there were nothing but translation conundrums and I, in translating I tend to just keep coming back to something and back and back and back until I can feel convinced of my own choice. And it turned out that wasn't really available with this book and that's why it ended up taking me so long. Uh, no matter every, any time I revisited it, it just seemed to compound doubt. Again, in a very Kafkaian way, where the more you're seeking certainty in this situation, the more you're sowing doubt and frustration. Um, uh, so it tended to spiral. Um, but the amusing translation thing, story that I have is um, the travel diaries pose a problem in that he was writing, the, the technical term for it is parataxis, where you just kind of list. Um, um, things side by side that don't necessarily have anything to do with each other. Like, he's just making a list of sort of his observations and it could be over three days of travel, think, sort of things I'm committing to memory and you don't know from one item in the list to the next whether now it's two days later and he's in a different geographical location. What is he referring to? Is he in a museum now? Is he in a park? Um, what is this little jotting referred to? He had one that seemed to translate, in, it, it was seemed like a school, which seemed to translate in, to, in, into English somewhat oddly as a, as a considerable chair or some kind of impressive chair. Um, so I was like, did he go to a furniture museum in Zurich? Or like, I was thinking of Game of Thrones, like this, you know, some kind of chair that was 
somehow um, remarkable. And then it, it occurred to me that we call um, poop stool, and that the Germans call poop chair, stool, the same, you know, the cognate of stool, but it means chair, stool, and that Kafka had been complaining about his digestion just like an entry or two ago. And um, so that was actually, unlike many of the translation problems I had, I, found, I felt that great feeling of, oh, of course, he's saying it was a, you know, I think I translated as considerable stool. <laughs> I think we'll end on, I think we'll end on that now. inscribe each of them with considerable stool and you can cherish that for the rest of your lives. It's, an, it's just an extraordinary book. I cannot say enough good things about it. Congratulations. Thank Congratulations. you so much. Congratulations.